Uh, thank you for being here today, as uh, well as much more regarding uh, what you've done for my life personally. Um, my guest today is, is uh, Professor Catherine Perone, a lifelong educator who has dedicated her life to education in many capacities. My guest today is quite literally the best educator that I've ever met and has engraved herself among Arizona's greatest throughout her impact on, American, er, on Arizona education. Her contributions include a significant contribution to my own education as an educator through Mary Lou Fulton, as well as many other students that have come to this college. Catherine Perone is possibly one of the greatest educators alive today and is another Arizona educator that has undoubtedly shifted the course of human events toward a more positive future. If you would like, uh, would, you, would you like to tell us a little about your background, a little bit about your, your personal life? Well, I started uh, in, in Buffalo. I went to Brockport State University and then I transferred to Buffalo State. I always wanted to be in education, so I pursued uh, education in mathematics. And at first, I was not going to teach. I thought I wanted to, but then I thought I would do mathematics and then economics and have a double major. But really, I came back to wanting to be a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. It really made a big impact on me. Although, when I was very young, I would go into her classroom. And the reason why I wanted to be a teacher was because I got to write on her chalkboard and erase it every day. So I thought that was the best job ever. Of course, there was much more involved in it than I, <laughs> I hadn't expected. But, you know, at 10, who knows. But at any rate, I uh, graduated with a BA, no, BS, BS in mathematics uh, from Buffalo. And then I got a job. In the first job interview I had, uh, I did not get the job because it was a job for uh, the Diocese of Buffalo. And I had been married. I married in my uh, last year of college as, um, you know, earning my bachelor's. And my last name was Perone. And they erroneously thought that because the Perones were big members of the, the parish, that I was Catholic, and I was not. Uh, and I was totally fine in the interview. They wanted me to teach math for eighth grade, got it. They wanted me to teach PE. Okay, I can do PE. Then she says, and of course you have a religion class. And I said, oh, that might pose a little problem because I'm a Methodist. She says, Father will never go for that. She says, no. She says, I will pray for you. I said, fair enough. So then I went to my next job interview, and uh, it was for a junior high school. And it was time to junior high school, and I got the job, and I taught seventh grade math for four years. Wow. Yeah, uh, great job. Didn't want it at first because junior high school was, you know, a difficult age. Uh, I thought that, oh no, high school would be so much better, and, but it wasn't. My four years there was a great experience for me. Uh, and kind of prepped me for everything else that has come along for me. So after four years, my husband had gotten a job in Arizona of all places. So I came out here, no job, but he had one, so it was good. And I got a job with Glendale Union High School District. And I started at the alternative school, where it was in a farmhouse. And we had 60 students who came from the nine home schools that were not successful in a traditional school setting. And they had other problems that they had to deal with, especially with uh, law enforcement. Let's just put it that way. So. Uh, I taught in a farmhouse for about five years, and they hired me to teach math, Arizona history. I was from New York, but I learned Arizona history because I had to take a class in it. I taught reading and uh, economics, and I did that for wow. Yeah, I, I was a little concerned at first, and, uh, but at that time, you didn't take tests and things like that. They just looked at your transcripts. Uh, and I'm not going to say when because it will give away my age, so I'm not going to say anything about no, no, that. No. But um, I called the State Department and they said, hey, they're going to hire you to teach that stuff. Go ahead and teach it. I thought, yeah, okay. How hard can this be? It was difficult because <laughs> it was very difficult, but I did that. And then I transferred to Sunny Slope High School. Sunny Slope. And I taught, the first year I was there, I taught basic, uh, basic general math, which I didn't think existed. It no longer does. It was just teaching addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of whole numbers, fractions, decimals, and percents, which I thought was ridiculous. It was just so much below what the kids could do. Yeah, yeah it was really low. Uh, so the first semester, I taught everything in the curriculum 
And then I started teaching them some algebra. And one kid said, hey, wait a minute, you got the wrong people here. Because we don't do algebra, I said, you do now. I said, because we're not going to do, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Yeah. And they did, they did very well. It, it taught me that, you know what, all kids can learn. It just takes some longer than others. And it takes you to fill in the holes that they, you know, for background information. Uh, so I taught there for, I taught basic algebra two, and I taught algebra, so I had three preps, and I taught for one year. Then after that, I became what was called an instructional specialist in the district. Okay. Uh, and I worked with all the teachers on the Sunny Slope campus, and I would go into their rooms, and uh, I wasn't an evaluator. I was like the guide on the side, okay. uh, getting them ready for their evaluations. And so I would go in and uh, just look for the instructional delivery uh, skills and the strategies that were effective and those that weren't. And some of them had some difficulties with classroom management. So I would sit down in conference with them and talk with them about that. And my whole point was to make them better than they were already. Of course. Uh, so I did that for five years. After that, the uh, override didn't pass in Glendale Union. So the first thing they did was cut the instructional specialist. Mm. And it was like, okay. So now I'm figuring I'll just, I'll be back in the classroom. But that didn't happen because then they wanted to start a program for uh, kids who were below uh, Title I. They wanted kids who were below average in math and in reading, and they put me in charge of the program. Oh, wow. And what I did was I not only worked with, I had six instructional uh, aides that went to the classrooms, and I gave them uh, professional development, so they, they were professionals, but they had to know what to do to help the kids. So they would go in and work with the kids in teachers' rooms. And I also did all the discipline of that cadre of kids. Wow. Um, it, was, it was great. I, I really enjoyed that a lot because I got to, to do teaching and administrative kinds of things. It's kind of really expensive. It was. And I, was, uh, I did have uh, a class, my own class. So I taught uh, Algebra 2, and it was Honors Algebra 2. And I taught that, and then for the rest of the day, I work with the paraprofessionals, the teachers, and then, of course, any kind of discipline issues that might arise, like truancy and things like that, of course. Uh, with the kids who were in my program. And I did that for a number of years, and then they decided in the district, after five years, since they didn't bring the instructional specialist back, they brought in a mentoring program. And the mentoring program, they were gonna hire uh, nine mentors, one for each school, who would be responsible for working with all first, second, and third year teachers, not only to the district in a general sense, but then specifically to your home school. Of course. So uh, by that time, I had already gotten a master's in uh, math education in New York. So I'd done that. So when I came here, I had both a bachelor's and master's. I'd also gone and gotten an uh, administrative certificate for Arizona, and I, then I decided, well, I might as well go for uh, community college as well. So at that point, they were giving lifetime certificates to teach in community oh college. My. Yep, so I got one of those too. Oh so my. then, I, and I'm on my way and, and uh, with administrative uh, experience as well, so I uh, interviewed for the job as mentor, and I got that job, and I stayed at that job until 2009, wow. and I taught uh, two classes. I taught uh, AP Calculus, 7.30 mm -hmm. in the morning. They loved it. Wow. I liked it, but the great kids, so I taught AP and then I taught honors uh, pre-calculus pre that wow. would go into uh, calculus, and then I worked with the first, second, third year teachers. Uh, best job ever, uh, because I had the chance to, to have an effect uh, and influence on a lot of students. Yeah. So I, yeah, I enjoyed that very much. And we did uh, workshops for all the teachers in the district. So that was fun too, first, second, third. Then after I left, uh, a friend of mine and I started a consultancy business. We called it P2 Professional Development, P squared, because his last name was Pfeiffer with a P and my last name was Perone. Anyways, we did a lot of uh, things with uh, different schools, and we also worked for the State Department uh, for uh, charter schools. And right. we, we went around the state, and we um, 
talk to people about their program improvement plans because they were on, eh, they were sliding down and they weren't going to be able to keep their charters unless they came up with a feasible plan that they could uh, administer with fidelity. And that was our job to talk to them and then determine if it could really happen or not. Of course. Uh, and then their charter depended on some of what we had said. Okay. So we did that and of course we went to other schools and did professional development. And at the same time, I came, came back to ASU. I taught at ASU many years ago in the summer and it was uh, math methods. Yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. So, wow. So math methods and I taught that summer school for like probably four or five years. But then they decided that they were going to uh, put it into the regular fall and spring curriculum. So uh, at that time I was way too busy and I said, no, I can't do that, but thank you very much for the opportunity. But when I left and we had the, the business and everything else, then I just thought, well, why not? You know, I'll go back and, and see if I can uh, go back to ASU. And so I started, I, I went back there in I think, 2009 and I did, uh, I taught TEL 311 and I was uh, student teacher supervisor. Okay. And so I did that as well. Uh, now at this point, um, unfortunately my uh, business partner had just passed away oh, in so September. Sorry. I, and, I, yeah. and so uh, I'm now just, I'm working uh, with ASU. Oh, and also I forgot to say that I also was uh, on the board of directors for two charter schools. Oh, wow. Uh, both in uh, Maryville. So, yeah. Uh, kind of, you know, a difficult area sometimes, but the, the schools um, are doing a really good job. And one was a K through six, and the other one was seven through 12. And one was, the high school was a STEM school. So, uh, and I did that for about five or six years over for a, a charter foundation, wow. challenge foundation uh, for charter schools. And I'm still at ASU, and I'm currently teaching SED 464, and this is where I am. <laughs> yes, you're still at ASU. Yeah, that's where you. That's where you. Uh, I think you. You are making some serious change there, um, or I clearly would be here today. Um, now, it, it, this is kind of off topic. Kind of shifts a little bit towards, mm -hmm. towards your personal life. But uh, what was it for those living in the desert and in Arizona and, and going to school out here uh, in the contemporary era? What was it like uh, for you growing up in New York and, 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 and your education in New York as well? It was when I came in, in, in New York. Well, in New York, totally different. Yeah. No. It's just totally different. I had no idea what it was going to be like when I got here. Okay. I, I didn't know what the 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 uh, level was going to be, level of achievement. Uh, I didn't even know what their schools were like. Uh, of course. It, it was somewhat different uh, from New York because everything was local and everything we had cultural things like so concentrated that we could you know just walk there or, you know very short distances and here everything was of course it was so spread out when I got here in 1977 I mean that was like wide open spaces but the one thing that never changed were the kids it didn't matter if they were in New York or if they were in Arizona that their characteristics are the same their developmental levels are the same uh, the only thing different is is their uh, environment for climate and things like that. But we had just the same kinds of things happening in the homes in New York as happens in the homes in Arizona. So that was, then it was like a slam dunk. It was, you know, I, I just felt very comfortable. Uh, yeah, I just felt very comfortable. Just, there was, in that transition, it was a, it was an easy transition from the schools in New York to the schools in Arizona. What well, wasn't a smooth transition was just, being away from my family, I'd never been away from my family or John's family, uh, and we were out here all by ourselves. And that was a, a transition unto itself. But I got used to it, and once I got the job uh, with Glendale Union, it was like, yep, yeah, I'm going to make this work. And I never never regretted the, the move, never regretted the change. I was afforded a lot of different opportunities uh, along the way, and uh, I was pretty blessed with that. So. You're, 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 you've, you've, you've clearly climbed to the top. I want to I want to take a break for a break. Revisiting people will continue after this brief break. All right.
right, so this is my second uh, part with uh, Professor Perone. Uh, again, a, a, an individual I, I respect and, and honestly believe uh, maybe one of the best living educators today, uh, honestly, hands down. Um, now, I, I want to sh shift kind of back to uh, an individual and, and some of the work that, that I was introduced to through, through your class, and that is uh, Marzano. Um, and, and I've actually bought several of his books since. Um, because of the class, and I thought that uh, you, the the effectiveness of your education and in, in your instruction was able to, to really kind of um, produce a, a significant change in all of the people in your class that we talked about throughout the entire cohort. Well, now I I've been trained uh, in many different things, and the the training uh, started in New York and then continued when I came here, uh, but. The, one, the people that were, uh, we researched a lot and we, we blended into our instruction to teachers as well as our instruction to kids was um, Marzano, of course, but Marzano and Harry Long and Fred Jones and Madeline Hunter and Rick Lavoie, they all blended in together so they weren't in isolation. Okay. Now, they're all talking about the same thing. They're yes. talking about... Uh, instructional delivery and effective instructional delivery and what works in classroom management along with instructional delivery but they may call it different things they may add their they always add their own spin to it uh, they put their signature on it of course. Uh, but basically it's it's all the same yes. uh, and so I was able to that, that was that was kind of fun for me because I was to uh, focus on Marzano but I was still able to, to draw in and pull in from my experiences um, and the things, the people that I had met, um, I had met, uh, I was trained by Fred Jones. I was trained by Harry Wong, met wow. both of them. I actually had the pleasure of meeting Madeline Hunter. I thought that that was, that was like the coolest thing in my entire life. That is amazing. Uh, she came to the district and the instruction specialist had a meeting with her. And she was, oh, she was in her 80s by that time. Dynamic, uh, intelligent, uh, full of energy. And I thought, wow, no wonder she's like she is, and she she inspires so many people. So uh, I took what I learned from all of them, and uh, I blended them together. Uh, we did teach Marzano uh, at Glendale Union also. Um, it just seemed, it was natural. Uh, so I, I uh, have a lot of Marzano books, and I, oh, and I, I read them, and then whatever I, they, there's so many commonalities that, they strengthen each other. And so what I do is take the strengths of all of them and it just builds uh, you know, a structure that I think is a winning structure in the classroom. I like Marzano a lot. Yeah, yeah really, I do too. Uh, I've started to build my, 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 my pedagogical bookshelf off of Marzano. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. and it, like I said, it all started with, within your course. Um, it, it, if, uh, so it's, it's been two years since I took your course in 2017. Um, what would you say you've learned most over those last two years, if anything? And of course, two years is a, is a, is a slightly, you know, it's a small kind of slice, but what, over, the, over the last two years, what would you say you've you learned most? Well, maybe not so much learned, but has been brought to the forefront and emphasized for me is no matter how many times I teach a class, it may be the same class. I always teach it somewhat differently because I have to style it and I have to, to um, mold it to the students that are in front of me. Of course. So uh, there, isn't, there isn't one lesson that I don't change a little bit or if I see that there needs to be a little more reinforcement in some area because it's all about the students. Yes. It's, it, for me, it's always been about the students. Uh, whether it's junior high school or high school or college, it's always about the students and it's always students first. So my main... Uh, Emphasis is always trying to find what works best for that dynamic that's in front of me. And I, I really believe in that, and I do it every single semester, uh, because it would, be, it would be monotonous for me to just teach the same thing over and over again. And, but everybody's personality is different, and every group's personality is different, and every group comes with its strengths, and it comes with areas for refinement and polishing. That's so uh, that always is... is in the forefront uh, of my mind. Do I find different things uh, that are kind of, 
let's say they're they're cool for you know and up to date and things that kids uh, now really like. Well, of course, because I'm I'm finding different uh, uses of technology yes. that that aren't for uh, entertainment; it's for engagement. And if I can find something for engagement that the kids really like, then you know that's just a plus. It's a motivational factor, and that's what I pass on. Uh, to my students, so it changes every semester based on what I, I learn. Uh, I'm currently, and I think I told you this, currently uh, tutoring to uh, students from China. Yes. And it's a very different perspective on education, and it's a, a just a different kind of feeling uh, that they have. And I will ask them questions, and they're very honest about things. And they will tell me what uh, they didn't like. They went to a British school, by the way, China. In China. Uh huh. It was a private school in China. Was it Hong Kong or? No, it was, was in. Um, it was in. Yeah, mainly China. Wow. And they they went there, and now they're uh, at a charter school. So I asked them what the differences are, and and I'll ask them what they like, what they really don't care for, and uh, they'll tell me. They, say, they know that I have aspiring teachers, and they say, no, make sure you tell them, and I'll listen to them, and. Uh, they shouldn't give homework unless we know how to do the homework. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't yell at us a lot. And it's a, and it's it's quite entertaining uh, for me. But I, I'm getting another cultural perspective That's because amazing. the parents are very. Their parents are very interested in keeping them uh, as international students so that they can compete in the global world economy. And wow. so. It's, that's a different experience for me yeah. as well, but I can bring those those kinds of things uh, that are relevant and will help my kids, my students at ASU. So that's a good experience as well. That's amazing. I mean, most people don't think about competing in the in, in the national economy, let alone the global economy. That that these these kids are on the path to uh, to success, to say the least. Um, so uh, one of, one of my my big things is. Throughout my time at Mary Lou Fulton, I had some problems, mostly bridging the gap between the theoretical pedagogy and, and then the implementation of, of the pedagogy. Um, is there a way that we can gap that or bridge that gap, or is it, is, is it, is it just that some is theoretical and some is, is, is practical? Well, my, my philosophy, and I've always been like this, and this is the way I was trained, theory into practice. I can teach the theory, but if I can't teach how to take that theory and put it into practice in the classroom, then it's a nice to know. It's a theory. And, and there's nothing wrong with knowledge and there's nothing wrong with, with theory, but there is a gap that has to be filled. So personally, I think it's up to the uh, instructor to bridge that gap because yes. just like I teach, I taught you that you have to make connections for students. Yes. We have we as instructors have to make that connection between the theoretical and the practical and put it into practice. You know the theory, but it's a whole different ballgame to put it into practice when you're in the classroom with 35 kids and then you have five different or six different classes every oh, yes. day, and it's a scary prospect. So instead of just letting you figure out yourself, and you will figure it out, but it's painful and it takes a long time to figure it out. Instead of having you figure it out. I think it's our job to, to bridge that gap. And I think that we would have more successful uh, teachers if we did that for them. And if we can't figure it out, we, should, we need to find somebody who can yeah. to bridge that gap. Now, I'm not saying to, you know, give it everything to them, but it, bridge the gap and then say, go into your internship class. See what you see. Do you see that there's a, a, a connection between the two? If not, why not? And then we'll talk about it. So I think it's our, our obligation and responsibility as instructors to do that. I like I like that a lot. I like the answer. Uh, this is kind of going to go back a little bit. I I, I forgot I was going to ask you this because mm -hmm. it was kind of a follow up. Uh, so do you still uh, remember every single student's name every, the first day they walk in? Are you still doing that? I am. You are. I, I, yes, I am. And every 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 year. Every every, every single, semester. Every semester that I wow. teach, I do that because. That's one thing that I always want to teach teachers is there's power in names. Yes. It, it shows kids that you care. It shows kids that you're making an effort. Uh, and it personalizes the, the relationship and the rapport that you have uh, with the students. So actually this past semester, 
I always look at the, their pictures yes. and then their names, and I memorize those before the first day. So I went into the class, and the class was um, in somewhat of a, a different arrangement, and I wanted it to change. And I saw three men, that I, and I called them by name, and they said, you know our names? And I said, yes, and I need your help. And uh, they set up the room, and from th that day forward, the, if there's a different arrangement in the room, before I walk into the room, they have the room all set up for me. Uh, so there is, there's total power in names, and there's total power in names when you're working with kids, because someone has to care about them. Of course. And that shows that you care about them. Definitely. So, yes, I do that. Well, I've always, I, I, I've always remembered that and, and loved that, just like I walk in, hey, Warren Seth, and how, how do you know my name? I'm like, oh she my. Knows my yeah, name. She, she, she actually, she pays attention and, and, and cares. Um, so um, among the many hats that you wear and the achievements that you've had, what would you label as being some of the more successful achievements that you've had in education, in the field of education more broadly? You know, the, the thing that, that comes to mind is always any kind of uh, achievement and growth that I've had in my students. And it's always, if you ask me that, my mind goes directly into the classroom. Whether it, you know, it's with the junior high school kids or the high school kids or ASU students. It always goes to the student. And what I did, if I could take them to where I wanted them to be. Did they know more than they did before I even met them? Did I, did I teach them enough so that they feel confident enough to pursue what they want to do and be successful and happy? So, and did I teach them enough to know that maybe this wasn't the right thing for them to do? And they chose something else and that's happened as well. So it's really at all that my achievements have always centered around student success. So around the classroom. Yeah. Oh, that's that's amazing. Cause I, and I know most people they're like, oh, I, I did this or I did that, and said, instead you're like, no, it's 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 what the impact of, was on the students. Absolutely. That's 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 beautiful. Um, so do do you have any other achievements or positions that you would like to preserve in your world history? Aside, aside from your, of course, your, your classroom work, any, any, any achievements that really stand out that you want to kind of set in stone? No, I've had, I've had honors bestowed upon me okay. for, you know, achievement uh, in my district and, you know, the usual, like, who's who and you get in books and you get in, uh, I was in Arizona Kids Magazine. Uh, those kinds of things, uh, and those are nice. Yeah. Those, are, those are nice, and, and it's nice to have, but the thing that validates me the most is the success that I've had and continue to have in the classroom. Of course. So, uh, at that point, probably not, and I'm sure yeah. I've done other things, but I think that... It's all, uh, it's all the classroom. Yeah, it's it is. Kids. It's all about the kids. It's, it's all about the students. So. This, this, is, this is why I, I, I like you so much. Um, so. What drove you to be an educator, uh, more importantly, an educator of educators? Was there anything specifically that drove you, or was it more of just like taking the path that, that you followed? Well, the, the opportunity was afforded to me, and I started to think about where would I have the most impact on more students? Because basically, I taught, and I had what, probably 150 kids a year, but when I started working with other teachers, I had impact on their students as well through their instruction, through what they were doing, yeah. through how they were working. And so I really liked that idea. How could I have more impact on more kids? And that's why I kind of went in that direction as instructional specialist and then as a mentor. I think you have to be ace, you need to expand your role. I think, I, I'm serious, I, I really truly do believe in back to the beginning. Um, possibly one of the greatest educators, period, uh, in my opinion. I, like the, the, the stuff that I was able to learn personally and the, uh, what I was able to implement from you specifically and, and um, what the cohort, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, among the things the cohorts discussed, uh, it was that you were among the best professors they've ever had.
it seems like almost a natural path that you, you took to become an educator. Despite the many difficulties and obstacles within the field of education, I mean, there's, there's a plethora with the parents, with the teachers, uh, with the admin, with, with the parent. I, I think I said that twice, but um, what, what keeps you coming back year after year? The students. students. And I, I truly still enjoy being in the classroom. Uh, my coordinating teacher when I was student teaching, his name was uh, Bob Ivory. He was a great guy. And he told me, he said, when it's no longer fun, you know it's time to leave. And it's still fun. And that's, that's my philosophy, it always has been. Wow. So it's still fun. I still enjoy it. I like being in the classroom. I was, I was transferred from math to a more pedagogical outlook. That took a little bit of, of time for me because math is so process oriented and it's pretty linear. And yeah, yeah, yeah pretty linear. And, and with this, there's a lot of different curves in the road, so to speak. But once I knew what I, where I was going, and then I had to figure out how I was going to get there. There were more ways than like one or two ways to get there. And that's when I really started opening uh, my mind up to a lot of different kinds of things and uh, became more open-minded to, to some things that I hadn't when I first started. Of course. Because when I first started, I thought there was only one way. <laughs> Yeah. I learned quickly that there's, there has to be more than one way because you have lots of different uh, students in front of you with different kinds of learning uh, skills and talents. So. Of course. They're, they're very across the board, right? Yeah. Um, what are some programs or elements within education that you, that you think are going very well right now? Specifically programs? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, not necessarily specific programs, but uh, so, so some things you think are going well in the field of education, probably. Well, I think more expansion on differentiation, differentiation. of instruction. Okay. And that doesn't mean, they, these, these are not new ideas. Yeah. These are outcome-based. Of course. These are not new ideas. They've been around forever. They're just called something different. Uh, but certainly the differentiation of instruction, the uh, more flexibility in the way in which you teach uh, for your lesson plans, either direct or indirect, or a blend of both. Uh, infusing technology where it, it has a meaning and it has engagement for the students, that's huge. Uh, I think that a lot of the different uh, programs that they have, you know, the uh, how to teach value to students and integrity. I see those programs, and I think that you probably have seen those in oh, yeah. junior high school. Uh, yeah, and I think that's that's also a, a good thing. Uh, yes. Community involvement uh, for the, the students. In some schools, we offered, you know, they had to do community service. And that's not a bad thing. No. And they were able to choose what they wanted to do. Uh, some kids just bought that and said, no, I don't want to do that. But once they got into it, it felt good for them to do something for someone else other than themselves. Of course. Because teenagers are pretty, you know, self-centered at times. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. The world revolves around them. Yes. Uh, but just the kinds of things that, that we've been talking about uh, for years and years, uh, teen teaching, more teen teaching, not uh, turn teaching, but teen teaching, having the, the um, parapro paraprofessionals in the classroom. Yes. Uh, something I've seen that is very effective, although uh, not embraced by some school districts and many school districts because it's very expensive. But having two teachers in the classroom, really and, yeah, and, and it's it's based on uh, I think it's it might be Finland, it might be that they have two teachers in the classroom at, at all times. They have a set. They have a subject expert teacher and a learning expert teacher, mm. and they both work together in tandem with the, the students. Great idea, it, great theory. Uh, is it effective? Yes. Is it cost prohibitive at most in schools? Yes. But that's a program that uh, is very good. They, you know, they, they have paraprofessionals. As long as they're, I see that they're training the paraprofessionals more. They're yes. not just dumping them in there and saying, well, help the teacher, help the kids. And it's like, they don't know what to do. Yeah. And now they're clueless. Uh, but not anymore because they're, they're 
they're receiving the development, the professional development that they need. So I think that that's a healthy thing. The at risk for bringing in the, the freshmen and having a program where they have one teacher, and it's not even a teacher that teaches them any kind of content, but it's a teacher who's a contact person. Okay. And they can, they can go to that uh, person if they have a problem or whatever. Um, certainly it would be good if they, and they're trying to get the student counselor ratio down to something that so the counselors can be counselors. That's another thing that uh, they're they're working on and they're trying to instead of having like four hundred and fifty kids and you don't know all your four hundred and fifty kids. No. You just you just don't. Um, trying to get that number down. Uh, programs like having social workers, full time social workers in in the school. Yeah. That's important because families, more and more families need that support, help and assistance that we as teachers can't give them. No. So expanding those kinds of resources that are available to not only the students but to, to the families because if you have a he healthy family, you're going to have more. Yeah, the kids are going to be healthier. I agree entirely. Yeah. And we can't do it all as educators, but we can promote those other kinds of programs that are support programs that directly and indirectly help us in the classroom. So those are kinds of things that I've seen and I, I see currently that are are working very well. It's so kind of like the tertiary elements, the, the, definitely the paras, the, 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 the two teacher teaching, I mean, the co-teaching. Co well, and now they, they, they've even, now they, a really good thing that they did was they had the, the case manager, the special ed resource teacher. Okay, yes. And they're in the classroom, uh, if there's a certain, you know, a, a population of special ed kids in the room, because what had happened years ago was, they went to their, their content specialist, the math teacher, and then they would go to their resource teacher. The resource teacher would look at this stuff and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what we're doing. Uh, or they would, do, they would look at an English essay and, and they, I, I don't know exactly what the teacher wants. Now they're in the classroom so that they can hear what the kids are hearing Smart. and help the kids after the fact. And they can, then they go into the resource room and they can... Uh, give them reinforcement. Uh, sometimes it's painful for the teachers, the resource teachers, especially math, <laughs> but oh, they're, well. they're, they're taking notes just like the, the kids, and that's a good thing for the kids to see too. Uh, so that, that kind of uh, teaching is, is working well. Plus, the resource teachers, my philosophy is, it, no kid wears a sign that says I'm special ed. No, no kid, Where's the sign that says, you know, I'm fragile mentally? If that kid needs help, I don't care who the kid is. One of those teachers need to help the kid. You don't say, take out your uh, ID and show me if you're, you know, uh, in this program. No, absolutely not. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, I also uh, did the program with them, the program with the, the students uh, for that were below average in uh, reading and in English. Oh, wow. Uh, the, the Title I program, uh, that was something that I also did and went in and worked with the, the teachers in the Paris to help them help the students to be more successful and to, yeah, and to get them to where they needed to be because the problem, the big problem I see is you have to remediate but accelerate at the same time and it's tough. And we still, still aren't good at it. No. We aren't. And so what do we have, you know, we have kids in ninth grade at a sixth grade level, but they need to be at the end of the ninth grade, uh, going into tenth grade, they have to be at the end of ninth grade. That's a huge gap, you can't, you have to remediate them, but you have to accelerate them at the same time. And that's something that we definitely, definitely have to work with, because we're not meeting the needs of the kids. Yeah, I have a real life comparison, I, have a, I had an eighth grader who um, was in the eighth grade, getting ready to go to high school, was a third grade reading level. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's almost, it's how do you, that's again, you know, trying to bridge that, that gap, but it's so massive, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Well, and they're the kids who are, who are at risk. They're the kids who you worry about that, are they going to make it to the end of their senior year? And then, of course, there's the uh, school uh, to prison pipeline yes. that, you know, we still, we're still uh, having to work on. And we're not there yet. I'm close. I don't think. Um. So so, 
Would you would you like to expand on the the, the school to prison pipeline and and for for, for the layman's who who may be watching and don't quite understand what that is? my understanding is that we're failing the kids somehow in high school okay. so that when they 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 drop out they leave or even when they they graduate from high school they don't have the skills they don't have uh, what they need to be successful in the outside world. So they tend to look at other things that may be more lucrative but illegal. And because of that, and they have, they lack direction and they lack confidence and they lack skills. Yeah. I mean, life skills that this is what they do and they end up in prison or they end up in jail, incarcerated. Yeah. And those are kids that, that we can't afford to be losing them. No, I, I think that's the best description I've ever heard of, of the prison, the school to prison pipeline. Because I think a lot, a lot of it gets muddled in, in again the theory, but that was a, a beautiful explanation of, of, of exactly what we're trying to prevent. Um, um, what, what what is the most important element in and this? This of course is probably very important to you, but I want I want to ask what is the most important element in working with students in building these meaningful relationships? Do you think? Kind of a hard, hard ball. Well, first of all, the thing that, that we all have to remember is just because we're standing up in front of students, we don't command respect. We earn respect. And it has to be mutual respect. First thing you have to do is, kids have to feel like you respect them. If you come in there and your expectations are low, they will live up to those low expectations. If you have higher expectations, and you show them that you do respect them as individuals, as students, as people, and that you have faith and with high expectations that they can reach those expectations. It's, I'm not talking standards, I'm talking expectations. The expectation is, you know what, you can get up here, and I'm here to help you get up there. So let's go up together, and we'll meet at the top. So it's really mutual respect, high expectations, caring about them, and being sensitive to, to things that are happening around them because all kinds of stuff happens. And you know, you don't know what happens to them when they go home. You don't know what happens when they walk out that door. You have no idea. And it would be really easy in education if our product, at the end of the day, we could take our product and be the students and we put them on a shelf. And then we close the door and we <laughs> lock it and we turn the lights off. And then we come in and the next day and we take them off the shelf and we put them in their chairs and they're exactly the same as when we left them. But they're not exactly Perfectly the same. The same. Yeah. They're yeah. not. They go out there and we have we don't have a concept of some of the stuff that no. they have to deal with. Their their family life or their street life or you know what what's happening just within themselves. We don't we don't always we're not good at identifying if they're depressed. We only have them. 55 minutes in a classroom. How do we identify the, the students who, who you know, are, need emotional help and things like that? And we're trying to look and we're trying to decipher all that kind of thing. It is very difficult. Uh, so it's, it's building that rapport and that's the first thing you have to do when you have those kids. Any kids. You have your, your students and that's the first thing you have to do. Never mind about the content. Because if you don't have mutual respect, you don't have high expectations, if you don't believe in those kids, then you can stand up there and you can have a math party all by yourself the whole year, and they're just going to sit there. Stand on the whiteboard by yourself. Yeah, yeah, really. So I think that those are essential things that you have to establish, and they're just human connection things. Yes. That's all. Just making the, 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 the reward. Yeah, you care about them. Greet them at the door. Yeah. How, you know, say something nice to them. What does it take? Two seconds? No. That's all it takes. And then you know what? If they're having even a bad day and they're coming in and you say something nice to them, it's not such a bad day after all. And they come in and you'll be surprised at what those kids can do. Wow. So, I like be that. Be positive. Oh, I love that. Um, so I'm, I'm going to keep going right now. What, what, what are, uh, would you be willing to share, or I, I don't know if you have had any uh, confrontational encounters over the years that you've been in education? With students? Yes. Oh, yeah. So would you like to share it? Well, certainly with classroom management, when I had uh, a class, it was a study hall, and I had about 90 in the study hall. 
Yeah, it was a huge study hall. Nice. And they came in, and I would take attendance. And this one kid wasn't in my room for study hall the previous day. And he came in and he says, I need you to sign this. You didn't mark me as present. And I said, that's because you weren't present. And he said, you don't know. I was in here. I was in here the whole time. Wow. And I said, well, I beg to differ with you. And he started to, you don't know what you're talking about. And then I thought, you know what? I was trained by Fred Jones. Fred Jones says, if you don't know what to do, keep your mouth shut. Don't do anything. If you don't know what to do, do nothing. I'm going to sit there. I listen to him. And all the other kids are kind of getting like a little uncomfortable saying, hey, you know, shut up, dude. She's not talking back. You're kind of slow and like you're, you know, being pretty dumb. And he, he went on, and it seemed like forever, but it was probably at most 20 seconds. And all of a sudden, boom, he stopped. Wow. And I thought, this stuff works. Just silence. Yeah, silence. Silence. Don't say anything because they say, you know, it takes one fool to back talk. It takes two to make a conversation out of it. You don't want to be the one making a conversation out of it. So from that point on, it was, it was very simple to just, you know, keep, keep calm and let them emote. They stop and you go on. Uh, certainly I had uh, some that were, parents were upset about their, their child's uh, grade. And especially in AP Calculus, because they never got a, a B in their entire life until they got into my class. The tiger moms. Uh, and the mom was there, and she was in front of the, the principal, and she said, you gave my son a B. And I said, no, your son earned a B. I said, he's a very pleasant child. I said, he's very courteous. You've done a wonderful job raising him. I said, he works very uh, diligently. Uh, but he earned a B. And she said, she wanted me to change the grade. Now that's something that I will tell teachers. If, if you're making a true assessment of the student's abilities, then why would you change it? I mean, why would you change it? Uh, because a parent wants it. Revisiting people will continue after this brief break. I think, uh, I, think, I think it's definitely easy to get weighed down by the negatives, especially because, mm -hmm. because the negatives can be so bad, but the, but the, the positive moments I definitely, I'm 100% sure, uh, throughout class room day, uh, outweigh the, the negatives. I'm, at least, at least I, as far as my, my experience has been. Um, what, what, what is, uh, this is kind of, kind of jumping around a little bit. That's but, okay. What, what, what was it like uh, working with my cohort, and do you have any specific memories that stand out when we working with my cohort? I just remember a real dynamic group that, it, you know, they learned to, you learned to work with one another cooperatively and, collab uh, and collaboratively even though the personalities were so different, uh, you were very uh, motivated and eager to learn. You were open to uh, ideas. Another thing that's really important to me, you had a good sense of humor. Uh, I think that uh, I, I felt good every day I went in and I felt good coming out oh, every yeah. day. And I always say, because my husband would come in and out with me, and I, oh, yeah, I every that. single yeah. day, and he'll tell you too, that I would, I would come out and I'd say, they're a great group. Oh, and he wow. said, thank you. You always say that when you come out. And you were, because you were interested and you wanted to learn. And you know, the, the best thing is, you know, you were like, you, you were like sponges. Now some of the things you're thinking, I don't know if that's gonna work. And then you'd see it and you'd think, yeah, maybe she doesn't know what she's talking about. And that's the whole thing. You know what, I can say whatever I wanna say, but unless you see that it works, it's like, yeah, she's, yeah, she's an old lady. She just say, yeah, that's good. And, you know, go on. But, um, no, you are really a, a, a very energetic and very intelligent group. You ask good questions. And, like I said, you, you had uh, a good sense of humor. And it was just pleasant to be in the room with you. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I know a lot of my cohorts go on to... Uh, uh, do some pretty good things, and you know, at least one of them is in a master's program other than myself. So uh, we're, we're, we're still 
shooting for the stars. And, Good for you. You know, so. Um, so did you have a mentor? So I, I, I had my, I had my mentor um, in my last semester. Her name is Julie Fleming. She works at the Dice Art District at Rancho Gabriela. Very, very good woman. Uh, great, excellent teacher. Um, did you have a mentor whenever you were becoming a teacher? I did. And his, I had two. Uh, one was uh, Bob Ivory. And he was, he was so different. Uh, I learned very quickly. He he was uh, he would always go down in the the basement of the school like that was like a dungeon, and he would run in the morning. Really? Uh, yeah, before class, and then he'd take a shower and, and dress and everything else, and then he'd come and and uh, he'd teach. And we taught trigonometry. It was eleventh grade trigonometry. We taught five sections of it. So I was oh, his wow. student teacher, and so at the very beginning, he said to me, "Do you run?" And I said, yeah, when I have to, I guess. When I have to. You know, I'm not, do I do it for sport or enjoyment? Uh, no. If there's a lion. And then, then, yeah, if I have to, I'll run. <laughs> and he said, you need to come down and run with me in the morning. Oh, yeah. And I said, I thought, are you kidding me? And I thought, no. You know what? He's going to teach me, and I'm sure there's a lesson in this somewhere. So I brought all my stuff to school, went down in the basement, and this guy could run. And I'm just, you know, I'm 22 years old, <laughs> running and running and running, thinking, I'm going to die <laughs> right here. And he got to the end, and I, I just, I thought that really my lungs were going to burst, and I was praying that my heart would stop, and I didn't have to go to class. <laughs> and, seriously. And he said, I just taught you a lesson. And I said, what was that? And he said, you never give up on kids. You never give up. And I thought, never give up. I like this guy. And that's the lesson that he taught me. And he, from then on, did, he didn't, I didn't go down there and run every day. There was no way I was going to do that. Lesson learned. I was a quick learner. And, but at the end, he, um, he had to leave the last two weeks. And I... Um, took over his classes, actually got paid. Ooh. That was oh, that was huge to my That's husband. Nice. That was like, oh my God, I'm going to get all this money. Awesome. I got paid $30 a day. And it was like, holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. And I walked into the, the office that day, and it was my first day of subbing. I felt like, oh, I was so grown up and everything. The woman in the office said, sit over there. And I went, okay, so let's sit down. And then she looked at me, and she says, you're late. And I thought, no, I'm not late first hour. I know that first hour doesn't start for another 15 minutes, but I'm going to be late. She says, you're late for your SAT, lady. And I said, I'm the substitute teacher. She said, uh, <laughs> I thought you were a, a kid taking the SAT. I said, no. She says, well, you better get to class. You're going to be late. And I thought, yeah. oh, my. So that was my, my first experience as being a sub. Uh, but then I had... I had to do high school and then I had to do junior high school. And I did junior high school and I won't mention his name, but he was he was a very an unreasonable kind of individual. And he I was the last student teacher that the university was gonna put with him because he had run off so many other ones. Yeah, good luck. So he told wow. me he said, Yeah, we I know we're gonna know you see right? Yeah. Yeah, we're still recording. He told me, he said, um, you know, you've, you've already uh, taught in a high school situation, so you ought to really already know how to teach. And so what he did was, it was back in the day where they had the, the, those big dividing curtains that you would open up and yes. they would open, and you would have like 60 kids in a room. Mm -hmm. My first time, he said, well, you go in there, and he said, and he pulled the curtain back, and I had 60 seventh graders from now. 67th graders. And I'll remember this and I thought, he's doing this on purpose. And I had one kid crawling up a pipe in the back of the room because back there they had these pipes that for heat. And this kid was climbing up this and I'm, it's like, no. I, I so I said, we're stopping right now. Everybody will look at me. <laughs> and I, I was up at the, the chalkboard and I 
this is a terrible thing. I hit the chalkboard with my hand and I said, we're not going to do this anymore. And he's on the other side listening to this. And they kind of looked at me like, well, I guess she means business. And so from then on, we had a math lesson, and it was the most difficult math lesson I ever did. But I went back in there, and I thought, you did this on purpose. And he's laughing, and he said, you're going to be okay. And I stayed with him the rest of the time, and we got along just fine. And I don't know why he did that to me, but most of the other people just walked out on him. And I guess I was just determined uh, that I wasn't going to, no, I, you know, that's what he wants, that's what I'll give him. And it, wow. it, was, it was awful. I went home and my husband will tell you, I, I was crying. I don't want to go back to her. And he says, you'll go back. And I went back. And then everything was fine. So so, so this was 60 students for the whole time? No. No, no. Just, just, just the, the trial. My first class. Oh, in, man. I was going to say, 60 students for a mm -hmm. whole semester. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> then I might have changed my direction. Okay. Uh, definitely. <laughs> so so that, that, that would have been my next question. Uh, was there any moment during your experience at all where you felt just kind of like, I don't want to, I, I, I want to quit? Like, you know. Sure there was. It was my 10th year of teaching. And I, that's when I thought, you know what, this is, this is not what I want. This is not the way I want it to be. And I decided that if that's not the way I wanted it to be, then leaving it isn't the answer. It's changing my situation that's under my control to make it what I wanted it to be. So after that, I started making it what I wanted it to be by using my brain and using the things that I learned in the classroom to be able to work effectively and in a positive way for kids because it was a, a, a difficult year for me and the rest is history because I just stayed. So it was, it was something that I had to do. But I, you know, when it came right down to it, I didn't want to leave teaching. Of course. I wanted it to all change, you know, magic wand and everybody's going to be great and, yes and woo it's all all you know unicorns and glitter <laughs> it wasn't and I had to change it and of course I you know I did and I'm happy that I did I never look back wow you well, like I said I'm, I'm glad glad you did um how do you how do you build a relationship with students families I think a lot of times that mm -hmm. that that families within, within an actual educational environment are are, are Maybe if if not one of the most the possibly the most important aspects in, in, in the educational um, environment because like you said we don't know what happens when they go when they go home and we don't know exactly um, you know if, if I call home what's going to happen right so right um, what, what what do you think about that the best thing that I can uh, offer is what I I did I started making good news phone calls home before I had to make any kind of phone calls home where there it might not be such good news. Yes. So I would uh, every week take five, five different kids. Now you can find something that they do well. You can find it. Sometimes you have to search a little bit more than others, but you can find something. And you call the parent and the first thing they say is, what did he do? Or what did she do? No, I think you misunderstand. I'm calling because, you know, he did da 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 da. And, it happened, it happened like, uh, first time somebody says, you know, I'm going to make some positive phone calls. I thought, I'm going to start doing that. And I called this one, and I said, uh, I just want to tell you how, you know, great it is to have your son in my classroom. And, she, and he said, yeah, the right kid? My, my kid's name is Dada Dada. I said, yes, <laughs> yes, I have the, your son. I oh. said, he gets a calculus book every day. He, he does his work, and then he'll go to art class, and if he's finished, he has art class teacher if he can you know work on his math and she wow. says yes and I said I just wanted to let you know and this kid was uh, 18 years old wow. he wanted to be emancipated because he thought his parents were just uh, too controlling but anyways uh, he came in the next day and he came right up to my desk before he said to me he said you called my father yesterday and I said yes I did he said to me it was the best day of my life there you have it there it is so I said, really? And he said, yeah. My dad, you know, I came home and he said, sit down. He says, your math teacher called him. He says, I said, what did I do? And father said, he didn't do anything. He did everything right. And he says, and then my mom came home from work and he made a big deal out of it. My mom was really proud of me. And I thought, you know what? After that, now, he wasn't perfect. And there were times I had to call. But 
for some things that weren't as good as what he had done. However, the parent was totally on my side. I'll talk to him. We'll help, you know, we'll work with you. So you have something positive you share with, with the parent, even if you call him and say, you know, there's something that he does that's really special. He comes in every day, he's always on time, he's a very pleasant child, and he's very courteous, and thank you for doing that, because he did, they're not born that way, you make them that way, and you, well, thank you very much. Then if you have to call him later, it's like, don't you worry, Mrs. Pong, I'll get on it. So to establish, you have to establish a, a positive rapport with, with parents. That's their flesh and blood. First thing you do is yeah, go on the positive. Because there's always times that, you know, you have to talk to them about, you know, they did something that they shouldn't have been doing or whatever. So uh, open communication. Make sure you get back to the parent within 24 hours because that matters. If you have that kind of open uh, communication and positive interaction with them initially, then you're going to have a strong parent-teacher uh, connection. And that's hard in high school because you have, you know, they're older. Oh, yeah. Even in junior high school, it's hard. Oh yes, and we I've observed that correctly. Yes, you have. Um, so, how this is kind of in the classroom course, and that like say you're you're so you're you're like a like an oracle, and I feel like, I feel like a sponge to try and get what I can. Uh, what? How do you establish your standards for behavior in the classroom? Well, first of all, in in you know at the very beginning. When they come in, everything is very organized. That's important because kids can know if you're if you're disorganized, they think. Hmm. And if you don't have an agenda, they will. And it's an agenda you won't let you won't like. So always very first day, they know where they have to sit. They know there's something up on the board for them to do. Yes. Uh, any rules, five rules, positively worded. I teach those rules the first week of school. Uh, of course, the consequences follow due process, and they're fair. But the one thing you have to always be is fair and consistent. You have to, if those rules are for everybody, you cannot waver just because, like, one kid might get on your nerves a lot and the other kid doesn't, so you let one kid slide but not the other. can't do that. You have to be fair and equitable to all of them. Of course. And you establish your rules. You teach the rules. You enforce the rules. You have procedures that kids can understand and that are reasonable. And things will work like clockwork, but you have to reinforce all the time, and sometimes you have to reteach because they forget. Of course. But kids are very perceptive and smart. Yes. And they know the teachers who, you know, what is expected of them. And the as long as your expectations are clear, and they understand them, and they're concise, and you're fair and consistent, there really isn't a problem. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you can see it within your own organization as, as we came into the classroom meeting. You had a designated position where we were, if we had materials together, I mean, this, is, this is a university, right? I mean, we, 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 we knew where it was at. We, we were expected to know where it was at, and we were expected to pick it up. So I mean, it's kind of, kind of you, you were teaching us, the principals. And that that's, that's, that's the one thing that I, I truly believe in very strongly, that I'm there to teach you how to teach your students. So... Yes, I understand that you're you're adult, and but I'm going to model for you. I want you to feel what it feels like, and then I want you to go back and implement it in the classroom. Of course. And I think that modeling and doing that, and you know, always saying, "Listen, I know that you know how to do this, but this is what we check for understanding." And those kinds of things, and it, then it just becomes ingrained in your brain, and it's like, "Yeah, I remember this. Yeah, check for directions. Check for this. Check for that." And that's important. Oh. All right, this is my final uh, piece of my inter my interview with uh, uh, Professor Perron, and I am I am so thankful for your flexibility, your 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 allowing me to be here in the first place. Um, as I try and expand my repertoire of, of interviews, and and you are by, probably by far the the, the most. Um, successful and interesting person I've interviewed so far. So, so thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart, truly. Um, now, uh, one of the last questions I wanted to ask was, uh, how, how can we re-engage students that are at high risk and that are likely to drop out? And, and do you think there's anything that can be done or is it a fixed mentality type of situation? Well, I think there there is things that you can do, but it's 
it's intervention at an earlier age. Now, I do know that what we have previously, previously done in ninth grade, the incoming eighth graders, like I said, we had a mentoring program. And every teacher, didn't matter who you were, senior teacher, junior teacher, every teacher got a certain number of freshmen. Those freshmen were their kids, and they had to make contact with them during the day, somehow, even if it's, hey, how you doing, or whatever, how's it going? Uh, if the, the student is having difficulty in, in a subject and doesn't want to go to the regular teacher because they don't know how to approach that teacher, they go to their mentor teacher. And also, by trying to, we try to pair them up also so they have friends because that's a difficult thing for kids. Nobody wants to be left out. You know, nobody wants to feel like they're the, the lone wolf and nobody likes them or anything else. Of course. So we include and have activities to include all the kids to see that we can try to start making connections and they can build friendships uh, because they come from all different places. But having them have a stable place to go and a teacher, because we don't have, um, at least at my school, we didn't have homerooms. Now yeah. that's another thing, we had homerooms in our uh, seventh and eighth grade and that worked really well yes. because I had the same group of kids seventh grade and eighth grade. So they, in, in the morning, okay. every morning I have. So I would get them pumped up and ready to go, you know, out to their classes and everything else. Of course. And uh, that's really important because then they, they had a stable adult because they, they're at risk for reasons that you know, yeah. maybe they don't have a stable adult in their life. So can the, the school fill in those voids so that they're less likely to drop out and they're more likely to stay in school because school's a good place to be. School has uh, teachers and, and adults who care about them and genuinely care about them yes. and sincerely care about them. So I think that there are things that we can do and sometimes it's just little things that we can do. Of course. You know? And well, just to make sure that they're involved in things. Just keep them engaged. In, yeah. In, 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 in out, and outside activities or whatever, wherever their interests are. I like that. Well, I, I just want to say thank you again because you've, you've changed my life and contributed massively to my success. Um, th thank you for your time with, with being here with me today. And I, I, I truly do appreciate it. I, I want to thank you again. Thank you so much for your time and, and, and everything you've done to contribute to my own education. Means a lot to me.